Right this way, folks. Step over to this side of the tent to meet Todd Browning's Sideshow Shockers. You haven't been thrilled until you've seen this new preservation master of the mystic, never before issued on a major physical media release. You're swoon and chill to the romance of the unknown, now restored and extended with additional footage never before seen on past versions and masters. And of course, the iconic Freaks itself is now finally on Blu-ray, brought together by the Criterion Collection with a new supplement of extras. Can Criterion's so-so encoding make it all the way through three films and extras without having any major problems? Find out in Todd Browning's Sideshow Shockers! Hello and welcome back to this damn full idealistic crusade. This video is a review of the Criterion Blu-ray release in their set entitled Todd Browning's Sideshow Shockers, which brings together uh, new restorations for three Todd Browning titles. 1925's The Mystic, which is a rarely seen but very important uh, silent Browning-directed film, which has a lot of the core themes we associate with Browning films. Uh, then, of course, the 1927 masterpiece The Unknown that he made with Lon Chaney Sr. and is arguably the best of their uh, many films they made together, when one of the most daring and striking still to this day of those films, and then the most famous, or in some cases infamous, uh, of course, is 1932's Freaks, and all three are here in brand new scans, restoration masters, uh, with new audio scores for the silent films, and packaged together by Criterion in this set that is trying to utilize, obviously, a sort of circus or carnival theme, which you, you can connect to all three films. I think the two silent films do at least play into some of the unique factors of Freaks, and all three are very representative of themes Browning was fascinated by and would return to time and time again, both in the silent days and in sound films. Most people are only going to be aware of Freaks going into this release, and that is the main draw. So it is to be applauded that Criterion chose to not just release Freaks on its own, but also pack package it with two extremely important Browning films that did have modern restorations and really desperately needed a, a modern Blu-ray disc release, and that they went to the lengths of producing an elaborate set. Uh, otherwise, Freaks would have been uh, most likely released by the Warner Archive as just a standard Blu-ray in terms of this same new preservation master and scan. The reason why I highlight this is to underline the fact that this set is three films and that the other two films are just as important as Freaks, so uh, don't go into this thinking that you're just getting the one film and the other two films are subject supplements because uh, there is an argument to be made that The Unknown is perhaps the best of Browning's silent films and arguably his best directed feature. Uh, you can make the case for many Browning films, but uh, that is the the level of importance of The Unknown, which is now seen here in a restoration that restores a substantial amount of footage since it's a shorter running time to begin with, and any restoration of uh, footage for a film that contains one of Lon Chaney Sr.'s greatest performances and thus uh, one of the greatest performances in the cinematic medium, uh, you know, that that's that's kind of important. So <laughs> it's not just that, that Freaks has finally gotten a new scan and is available on Blu-ray with extras, but we have new restorations of both The Unknown and The Mystic. So this, of course, is a must for Browning fans, a must for Lon Chaney fans, and a must for fans of Freaks. So to start, we'll talk about The Mystic, which, of course, was from 1925. This was made for MGM, which is where Browning had his great successes both with and without Lon Chaney Sr. in the silent era. So The Mystic is a film that uh, will be very uh, familiar to those who have not seen it before, who are only familiar with Freaks, because it opens in practically the same setting in a circus or carnival, where we have our sort of lead trio of gypsy characters uh, headed by the Zara character, played by Eileen Pringle, who's essentially the star of the film. And she and her compatriots have basically a sort of magic show uh, where they're constantly uh, performing illusions to befuddle the audience and using sleight of hand and all kinds of various uh, sort of classic magician stage trickery that the audience is led into. So it's it's rather amusingly done, but it's already setting up the idea of sleight of hand and illusion and what you see isn't exactly real and and adopting personas. And this is really the, the core theme of the film because they're spotted by the character of Michael Nash, who at first seems uh, mysterious. He's played by Conway Tyrrell in 
the film, but he is essentially a very renowned thief and criminal who uh, hatches this idea upon seeing their act to bring these gypsy performers back to the United States so then he can use them to basically hoodwink as many rich people as possible with uh, various seances and other tomfoolery to essentially rob them blind. And it goes quickly from there into a really fascinating examination of setting up and performing these fake seances. And the most elaborate is an entire sequence where we see the, the whole performance. And there's even some uh, quite interesting and uh, for the time period, quite well done usage of trick photography and some effects work to actually make that uh, seance come across in, in a certain eerie sort of way. All of this is right up Todd Browning's alley, of course, because he had a lifelong fascination with the circus and performing because he essentially grew up in a circus <laughs> because he, he left home at a younger age and essentially grew to manhood in the world of, of circuses and sideshows and performance art and uh, never, never being above telling a, a fantastic story to get an audience invested, even though it might not have anything to do with what actually happened. But interestingly, and almost in a sort of about face sort of way, uh, the mystic transitions into more melodramatic territory at about the halfway point. Once we get our characters back to the United States and we see the uh, seances uh, first done, then it becomes more of a character melodrama because the uh, Nash character hatches a scheme to essentially hoodwink an heiress out of her fortune uh, by utilizing her uh, her adoration of her dead father and using the seances and, and means of perhaps contacting or hearing from her dead loved ones as a means to essentially coerce her out of her fortune. Uh, but uh, the Nash character starts to get cold feet about this and that causes uh, dissension among the group and starts turmoil and things and so in some ways it kind of becomes a bit of a different film and we don't quite have as much of the uh, sleight of hand aspects it becomes much more about the various guises that people have assumed in terms of uh, having ulterior motives and adopting different personas so we're still playing with a lot of the same core themes but really the the second half does get a bit more melodramatic and it does build to an interesting climax but the actual ending does feel a, a, a bit off kilter from from the final act of the film so I, I think if if it had felt a little bit more unified overall because the the main sort of uh, character uh, crisis of conscience is a bit unexpected and, and doesn't necessarily feel all that believable in ways for this supposedly notorious criminal to suddenly get this in incredible wave of of having a, a, a conscience nagging at him but it's also believable enough in the way that the film presents it but it's quite interesting in that at a certain point we, we sort of shift away from all of the uh, goings on of of putting on these illusions and things and and then we're into again more of a character melodrama essentially it's still an incredibly enjoyable film and very striking in certain elements especially for the time period in which it was made but the big takeaway and draw is going to be that it is so much of the core themes that we see throughout todd browning's directorial career both before during and after this point and it fits in perfectly with the other two films in this set because it even opens and starts in a circus and is all about illusion and outsiders adopting personas and trying to ingratiate themselves with a higher class but they're still outsiders and they're still scheming for different things and they they feel wronged in other aspects and are sort of wanting their own type of revenge if you will uh so you, you see this film and you it's got todd browning's fingerprints all over it and that's that's the main draw and it's really fantastic to be able to see it in this level of quality with this new scan this new presentation uh preservation master and a new score as well so i had seen pieces of this film before 
before, uh, but uh, never in this level of quality. And so that really adds to the overall enjoyment factor of being able to see this in a quality level such as this with a really well done new score. So it's a really enjoyable and again, very important film for, for Todd Browning's career and sort of setting the stage for the other two films in this set. So I do think it helps to view these films chronologically if you're if you haven't seen all of them before or if you're coming to this set even if you've seen them before I do think it's recommended to view the mystic first then go to the unknown then to freaks because you can see a sort of progression and you can see a lot of the same core themes carrying over in all three and on top of that it's just over an hour long it clocks in in an hour and 10 minutes so it's 70 minutes it's extraordinarily enjoyable very important for Browning's career has a lot of really fascinating sequences a good deal of even really nicely done humor in places and even manages to have a, a nice sort of more upbeat ending which is another thing that's that's not quite expected and not usually something you get in a Todd Browning film so uh, that that's always to be applauded when when he could do that now to talk about the picture quality of this particular new restoration and presentation on the Criterion release the mystic looks quite fantastic throughout this is a really nicely done restoration uh, the overall quality is quite a substantial improvement over any of the fragments or versions you may have seen of this film before this point. Uh, so again, anytime you can see a silent film with a lovely new restoration that's going to enhance your experience and appreciation of it. Uh, that isn't to say that it's an absolutely pristine or perfect element because we are talking about a silent film from 1925. So you do need to expect inherent wear and damage just from the, the wear of time itself. Uh, so there are occasional bits of frame movement, some bits of damage and scratches and things. Never anything too major, though. So it seems like the element they were working from was in overall uh, very good shape for a film of its era. But of course, it's going to have some inherent wear. So again, you'll see some scratches. There's one or two lines. Uh, there is some wear on some of the title cards. And then also one or two moments you'll notice where there's a slight... Uh, shifting focus or, or like the element is is a little bit going in and out of focus a little bit. I'm not sure if, if that's just inherent to the source or was inherent to the original photography, but there just are going to be some inherent defects from the original element that uh, nobody can really do anything about because that is just baked into the source that we have. But overall, this is a really handsome presentation and looks quite fantastic and is also encoded very well at a significantly high and consistent bit rate of around 35 megabits per second. So I was very pleasantly surprised to see that on a Criterion release, who as a label has not been doing the greatest with their encoding on Blu-ray discs for a long time. So anytime I see a, a Criterion Blu-ray release where the bit rate is at a consistent high average and it doesn't look like there's any major encoding problems, I'm, I'm quite pleased because it doesn't happen all the time and unfortunately it doesn't happen on all of the films in this set which I'll get to when we talk about freaks but uh, that was at least nice to see here on the mystic so with this being a 2k digital restoration I think on this blu-ray presentation that the mystic looks about as good as it possibly can be now the audio is a lossless stereo track of the new score by Dean Hurley who is known for his collaborations with David Lynch this is a really well done score it's super suits the film beautifully and has a the requisite eerie quality when it's called for in particular scenes but it's also one of those silent scores that isn't just music there are some moments where the score does use some sound effects or uh, a, a, a light choral effect where there's an actual singing voice uh, doing things that are kind of indistinct uh, so it, it, and that's perfectly fine it's something you find in uh, a number of silent scores, but I know some people are, are bothered when there are additional elements. Uh, but interestingly, it seems as if the the score also, instead of just having uh, additional sound effects and, and a, a choral quality to it, uh, it seems like they played around a little bit with adding hiss and crackle in places and some thumps and pops and ticks. Uh, so it, it seems like this score is also trying to be a bit of a performance piece. So there are moments where it, it threw me for a second because at first I thought it was a defect in the audio presentation. And then I had to look at it again and it started to dawn on me when it happened a number of times in a sort of 
dramatic way or where there was a, a moment where the there was less going on on screen i realized it was an atmospheric touch so um don't don't be thrown by that apparently that is part of this actual score and i've seen that happen or, or, or that that sort of effect be done on a number of more modern silent film scores so it's it's something apparently people are, are are wanting to play around with more in terms of scoring for silent films and if it's done well like this score for the mystic i i think it's quite effective uh, but in in some cases it it could be yeah, a little too heavy-handed so i think it's done here extremely well uh, just don't be thrown by that the first time you watch this restoration because the audio track does have some inherently intentional uh, elements that uh, might be seen as defects but apparently seem to be part of the actual score itself. Now in terms of supplements the the one real major supplement devoted specifically to the mystic is a specifically new introduction recorded by David J. Skull particularly for this release and this new restoration master. Now he did participate in this release with one one or two of the new extras like this, uh, but most of his contributions are derived from the extras he produced for the Warner DVD release of Freaks, and of course he had also recorded a commentary for Freaks, and previously recorded a, co a commentary for the uh, the shorter version of the Unknown for the TCM Vault Collection DVD set of Lon Chaney films, and of course since he is the person who literally wrote the book on Browning because he did write a Todd Browning biography among his other uh, many uh, in, absolutely indispensable film history works and, and classic horror uh, texts and reference books. Uh, it, it's, it's unbelievably poignant coming to these extras now because uh, this set was done and completed uh, shortly before, or at least a, a couple months before, he unfortunately uh, passed away uh, earlier this year. So looking at these extras now, and every time you come back to the set, it's incredibly poignant for those of us who uh, followed his work for, for years and decades, uh, particularly in the classic horror community. So there's definitely this, this poignant quality to reviewing these extras, and uh, Skull's work and scholarship was so absolutely uh, towering that uh, every, every extra or supplement or or book or article he ever wrote basically became a reference work for uh, people to return to time and time and time again so uh, his his contributions to the annals of uh, classic horror scholarship and, and film scholarship in general uh, are absolutely uh, profound and and will remain uh, such an incredible body of work so he has great greatly missed, but for those like myself who have been uh, fans of his for, for an extremely long time, uh, coming to this set and, and returning to it over and over as we all will, uh, these these will just be absolute treasures. And again, there's that definite uh, poignant factor uh, of, of visiting these extras. And for those who have not read any of Skull's uh, printed works or his Browning biography, they are absolute musts and I cannot recommend them highly enough. So uh, for this, he was able to produce a new introduction for the mystic, which gives the context for the film, uh, the, the background of how the story was developed, how the film was gotten off the ground at MGM, and where it places in Todd Browning's career. And of course, Skull talks about the core Browning sort of themes that appear repeatedly in his films are right there front and center in the mystic, which makes it very obviously a Todd Browning production and his because his fingerprints are literally all over it. And that, of course, ties it into the other two films in this set as part of the overall Browning canon. So uh, this is an absolutely essential extra. You can watch it before or after the film, even though it's listed as an introduction. Um, it's just a, a simple spoken word piece, but uh, with Skull talking about Browning or or any one of these films, it's an absolute treasure. Next is the, I, I think, without question, the absolute masterpiece of this set. And Freaks is a masterpiece in its own way, and all three films are great, but the 
absolute reason why this set is a must-own release is the fact that it includes the new restoration of the 1927 silent masterpiece, The Unknown, which paired Lon Chaney Sr. once again with Todd Browning in what is arguably the best film they made together. And this restoration is able to restore a substantial amount of footage because the film is already quite short in terms of its runtime. The previous versions were well under an hour, so this restores the film to about 66 minutes in length, so it's just over an hour, and it's as complete or near to the original release version as is humanly possible with the elements that survive, so it's really a miracle we have this much of the film intact. And in restoring this footage, it does give the film more breathing room, it flows better, and it allows the incredible Cheney performance to have even greater depth to it because the overall pacing is improved and it just it, it flows immeasurably better than uh, if you've only seen the previous version without this footage reinserted. The Unknown is of course filled with the themes that both Browning and Cheney are, are, are still famous for and since it was the silent era they could basically get away with murder whereas just a few short years later uh, nothing you see in the Unknown known would have ever been allowed, particularly once the production code had actually been strongly enforced starting in 1934, Uh, because the unknown deals with the core Browning and Cheney themes of sexual frustration, mutilation, uh, the figure of the outsider, illusion, deception, uh, adopting other guises and personalities, uh, the the desire for revenge when things don't go your way. (laughs) You can just run down the the checklist of the elements we we love and expect from uh, Todd Browning films and Lon Chaney films. And this is such a towering work that uh, as great as the other two films are, it's it's hard for any film to, to match the the sheer power of sequences in the unknown. For those who've never seen the film, I, I will give the the most basic of, of plot setups. Uh, we have Lon Chaney Sr. as Alonzo the Armless, who is a armless performer who works at a circus, uh, doing a knife-throwing act, of course, as you will, uh, using only his feet. And he performs feats throughout the film of both performance and just everyday activities, of course, without the usage of his arms, and that was part of the way the film was sold. And Cheney does as much as he possibly can, but uh, it, it, it was necessary to hire an actual person who uh, had that particular disability and had had a lifetime of uh, getting used to and being able to perform only with his feet. Uh, so there was some camera trickery involved, but uh, Cheney's performance is so staggering and the the illusion is so complete that uh, you, you wouldn't really know that unless you actually read about it or, or thought about it for a minute that it's, it's a bit far beyond even what an actor could do to prepare for a role in such a short period of time to have to actually train one's body to be able to have a lifetime's knowledge of even muscle memory to be able to pull off these feats. Alonzo is, of course, uh, hopelessly in love with the other partner in his knife-throwing act, the beautiful Nanon, who is played by Joan Crawford in one of her earliest film roles, and she's absolutely sensational in this film. Uh, she credited it with being the film experience, particularly working with Cheney, as the film that really uh, taught her what acting was all about and that uh, that was one of the greatest professional experiences she had ever had. And you can very much see it on screen. Uh, pretty much anyone who worked with with Cheney in one of his silent classic performances is automatically elevated when they're on the screen with him at the same time. Uh, but uh, interestingly, Nanon has a particular... Uh, hang up that <laughs> makes uh, makes makes her life uh, quite miserable uh, for whatever reason it's never expressly stated but one can surmise that in her past she had been perhaps um, assaulted or had a particular trauma that has caused this this fear she has a particular fear of hands particularly the hands of men and so she can't stand to be touched so the idea and theme of 
limbs and, and body parts and is, is already there from the get-go and is one of the core themes of the film and something you see throughout Browning films. And so as Alonzo has no no arms or hands, uh, he becomes her sort of confidant, never once acknowledging the fact that he's uh, madly in love with her. However, the strongman, Malabar, played by Norman Carey, is uh, very vocal about his adorations and is continually thwarted for reasons he doesn't quite understand. He can't understand why uh, anyone would not uh, return his advances. Uh, but this, of course, is the setup inside of the world of the circus. And one would think that this is a, 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 a good setup or, or at least a, a rather uh, a interesting setup for a love triangle story that, you know, is, is a bit atypical, uh, shall we say, but at least an interesting type of love triangle we haven't seen before. And then it is quickly revealed that Alonso himself is not all what he seems because uh, he actually um, does have arms and thus does have hands as well. And it is thus revealed that Alonso is actually a wanted criminal on the run from the police who, uh, along with the aid of his ever faithful uh, friend Kojo, uh, played by John George, uh, that uh, to hide out from the police, he has disguised himself as a carnival performer with no arms because he has a rather distinguishing feature on one of his hands. Uh, so it's, it's a bit of an elaborate escape method to hide out, but uh, it at least makes enough sense. But this, of course, stirs the pot of emotions further and builds the suspense that the audience is feeling to an incredible degree because we know that um, this is probably not going to end well. And of course, uh, it very much gets further complicated uh, beyond this point uh, because there are uh, various set pieces, deaths, murders, and of course culminating in Alonzo making the famously bad decision, <laughs> blinded by his obsessions for Nanon, to uh, perhaps uh, actually live out what he claims to be. And we have the absolute uh, personification of the uh, one of the favorite Todd Browning and, and Cheney themes of mutilation, and again continuing the film's obsession with uh, with body parts and of course with arms and hands, which are a continued visual motif throughout. Um, but it it must be stressed that even comparing this film to The Mystic, which was only a couple years before there there is a good argument to say that this was the best film Todd Browning ever made uh, at least of of when, not counting the the lost films that were were not were unable to see uh, the the sheer level of artistry that is on display throughout the unknown is absolutely beyond striking it is a film full of suspense and atmosphere and all of these themes of performance and and questioning identity and and sleight of hand and the outsider character Characters and and repressed emotion and sexual desires and mutilation and all, all, all the things that we expect from a Todd Browning Lon Chaney collaboration, but elevated far more than what we had seen in previous films they've made together, and in some cases carried even further in a film they would make later, uh, West of Zanzibar, which has ties even to Freaks as well. Uh, but in The Unknown, there's, there's, there's a poignancy, there's a poetic quality. It is a tragedy in so many ways, but it's also a film that goes for such delirious heights of pure emotion and uh, repressed emotions coming to the surface, uh, whether they be uh, love, hate, rage, uh, unbridled desire for what one seemingly cannot have. And the lead three characters of our love triangle of Alonzo, Nanon, and Malabar are much more uh, deeply drawn characterizations than what you would expect in a silent love triangle melodrama and again i think the other two i think both joan crawford and norman carey are far better than uh what what they would probably have been like at this time because they are 
elevated by Cheney's performance and the characterizations are more deeply drawn, more nuanced. In fact, I think this is just about my favorite Norman Carey performance. Uh, most of us associate him primarily with playing the romantic uh, love interest lead and in things like, of course, the, the 1925 version of The Phantom of the Opera, where it, it's sort of a thankless role, but he doesn't really have much of a screen presence other than being the sort of dashing love interest figure. Well, here as as Malabar, it's it's a complete about face from what you would expect from a, a Norman Carey performance and, and the type of roles he was known for. Uh, so I think that... Uh, the the other two in the love triangle being much more well-rounded characters that feel much more like actual human beings only furthers the audience's interest because we come to care about these characters they they feel real and vivid and they have real emotions and and fears and hang-ups and desires and this furthers our care for Alonzo because even though he gets a two absolutely dastardly uh, deeds that he carries out. It is all driven by his attempts uh, to grapple with his own emotional turmoil. So again, it is it is a tragedy in many different ways, but at its core, there's, there's an, an emotional resonance there that is completely genuine. And that's, I think, what makes The Unknown so striking, in addition to the absolute onslaught of Browning and Cheney themes getting to go full force. There is a, a grisly quality to the film. There is a nastiness and all of these elements being in the same film and the the artistry that Browning was able to achieve here, I think really makes it unique. And I think that's why The Unknown can easily be considered one of, if not the best of the browning Cheney collaborations and arguably the best film that Todd Browning ever directed. It is a complete work and it's a powerhouse the first time you see it because this is one of Cheney's greatest performances, which is saying something because in all of his iconic films, they're some of the greatest performances in the history of cinema. It is absolutely impossible to not be moved by Cheney's performance in this film. Uh, the 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 gamut of emotions that he runs through and performing the various feats uh, without using his arms and having them, you know, especially when he's wearing the the special harness that we see sometimes of uh, strapping his arms so tightly to himself that. When he gets to uh, take off said corset, he has to spend time rubbing the feeling and the blood circulation into his lifeless arms. It is it is an incredibly physical role, but it is an incredibly emotional role. It's one of the most... Uh, again, it's, it's Cheney at his finest, which means it is a complete and total performance. There is, you know, there's there's never a sign of artifice in, in a great performance, but in, in one of Cheney's legendary performances, uh, like what we have here in The Unknown, it, uh, that's, that's why I say it's a total performance. It's a performance that is felt in every fiber of your being, whether you love, hate, respect, despise this character, that does not matter. You have a, a definite uh, feeling about this character because the performance is so full of energy and life and vitality and... Uh, it examines uh, layers of 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 this character that uh, you simply don't expect in a feature film. There are there are moments in the unknown that uh, freaked people out, certainly in 1927, and will do so again even in the modern day. It remains a a real. Uh, powerhouse performance, but it's also a powerhouse of a film because there's so many disparate elements that are going on all in the same relatively short runtime that uh, when it, the film actually ends, it feels like you've been through an experience because you really have. And the film builds to an incredibly uh, powerful climax uh, punctuated by multiple moments of uh, of the Alonzo character essentially disintegrating mentally before our very eyes. There are close-ups throughout the film of, of Cheney's performance that are almost unbearable to watch because the emotional intensity is such that uh, you, you, you can't tear your eyes away, but you almost want to because it's, it's so powerful. But uh, in the final act of the film, we see moments of, uh, of Cheney's performance where... 
we see a, 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 a human being literally mentally break so completely that they run through every single emotional uh, quality in their facial expression in an instant. And there are particular close-ups where you see this and they, they will haunt you for the rest of your days. I mean, it is that powerful of a performance. I, it, it's, it's, you know, it's it's hard to ever say that something is uh, the greatest of someone's career, but one can definitely make the argument that this is Cheney's finest performance. It is among his masterpiece performances, but even compared to those, the emotional intensity, the, the overall intensity of his screen presence in this film is... Uh, so vividly felt that you never forget this film. You never forget uh, the, the the situations in the unknown. And that's why the reinstatement of some of the missing footage is so important because it allows the film to play out more as it was originally designed. Seeing it before, there were some moments that did feel a little bit abbreviated. You might not have noticed it as much until you realized the film was closer to about 45 minutes or 45 to 50 minutes or so. So, you know, obviously it's not the greatest amount of material that has been restored, but it is a lot of transitional material, uh, bridging material between scenes, parts of scenes that were not there before. So it removes that feeling of uh, the uh, previous versions that were significantly shorter, having just a little bit of feeling of, of, of choppiness to them. That has now thankfully been eradicated in this new restoration, and it is crucial to the film's overall impact to have as much of the footage reinstated as possible. So this is essentially a version that is extraordinarily close to the original premiere length or runtime. Uh, it's, it's not quite there, but it's almost entirely there and all of this reinstated footage just helps the film to breathe and run much more naturally and that the pacing feels i mean the pacing has been essentially restored as well because the the, the film no longer is is sort of going along and and having moments where it, it sort of feels a, a, a bit stunted in ways and unfortunately this is a problem that still dramatically affects Freaks. So rather interestingly, both The Unknown and Freaks did have this problem for a long time. But thankfully for The Unknown, we were able to have at least most of the missing footage reinstated. So if you compare The Unknown to Freaks now, uh, The Unknown does feel more complete in ways because Freaks was famously chopped down to just barely over an hour. The Unknown remains one of the great films of silent cinema. It's a film that everyone should see, whether you're a fan of Cheney and Browning or films that are sometimes considered in, in the horror realm, although The Unknown isn't a horror film. There are elements that you would typically associate with a horror film, um, but it, it is that powerful of an experience, and this restoration is truly important for restoring some vital transitional materials to make the film not only uh, very close to its original runtime, but to allow it to resemble more of its original self in terms of the pacing, the flow, the plot development. It, it, it doesn't have that, that slight choppier feeling that earlier, shorter versions did. The Unknown is so incredibly important for studying the careers of Joan Crawford uh, and, of course, Todd Browning and Lon Chaney. And again, Chaney's performance is so staggering and so total that... As with all of Janie's great performances, it does dominate the film, but but here it, it still feels uh, of, of the same whole because of, again, the, the deeper characterizations of the other two in our sort of uh, love triangle uh, play that is being performed, and the, the level of emotion, sympathy, dread... Uh, f fear, uh, suspense, and um, the, 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 all of this that's generated in the audience. It's a particular stomach churning, if you will, <laughs> that, that the audience feels uh, when, whenever you revisit The Unknown, even if you've seen it multiple times. It never loses that ability to uh, get the audience so invested in the characters that the audience starts thinking multiple steps ahead and seeing 
how this can very quickly go from bad to extremely far worse <laughs> and uh, just wondering how far this is going to go. And the unknown certainly goes there. It is an incredibly daring film, even among silent classics, and it's not lost any of its power to hold an audience spellbound and remains one of the truly great silent films which can now be seen in this fantastic and truly important restoration that now finally has a physical media release from the Criterion Collection in this set. It of course also remains one of the great date movies of all time. If you have a warped sort of very sick macabre sense of humor of course. Now to talk about the picture quality, this again is a brand new 2K Restoration Master. It was completed in 2022 by the George Eastman House. They did have to mix and match different print sources to actually find and then utilize the missing footage. So the image quality obviously is going to vary, and this is a silent classic from 1927 that's been in varying stages of preservation in different versions over the years. So there is quite a lot of wear and tear throughout just from the the passage of time so do go into this knowing that you are going to see plenty of wear from uh, light scratches to heavier scratches to fluctuations some missing frames here and there uh, hairs frame movement and all kinds of other things that is simply due to just the overall element condition and what they're having to work from there are some moments where the quality dips a little bit and that's obviously where they're having to mix in the other print sources and the new reinstated footage is coming from those so obviously that is of a different visual quality so this is a, a restoration master where they're having to mix together different print sources and try to at least make them match or be as close enough as possible and they do a really fantastic job at that so I, I think most people won't even realize that they are having to mix and match different print sources but that is indeed what they had to do i think the the biggest amount of where you'll notice is in uh, obviously some of the uh, or particularly the opening knife throwing axe scene which does use some optical effects uh, and that, of course, means there's generational loss. And then there are some moments where there is some pretty heavy uh, scratching or lines on a particular sides of the frame. But it's really a miracle we even have uh, a now mostly complete version of the unknown. So that is uh, completely understandable. And I think it is much better to have an archivally minded restoration like this, where you do have the wear and passage of time obviously very much present uh, I would that that's definitely the way to go as opposed to uh, what others might do in terms of trying to eradicate as much of that inherent wear as possible using digital tools and going overboard and then really messing with the actual original film image itself so do keep in mind this is an archival presentation there is plenty of wear and tear in, in this and they're having to mix and match elements the actual titles themselves did have to mostly be uh, recreated from scratch so they are mostly uh, mixed and matched between some original title card materials but also brand new digitally created title cards and they're done very well and they they tried to match the style of the film so I think most people won't even really notice this, but uh, if you pay close attention, you'll realize they did have to actually make brand new uh, intertitle cards with brand new titles with the correct original text. Uh, and this was also because the other prints they were having to use to reinstate the missing footage were obviously not English prints. They were in different languages. And of course, that meant that the, the, the title cards would not be in English either. So that, of course, made it essential for them to create brand new titles for most of the feature and then make those match as well. Thankfully, they were able to mostly be using uh, 35 millimeter materials. So the overall quality, in spite of the wear and the quality dips when they're having to mix and match print sources, is really quite staggering throughout. And and even if you've had the, the previous version on the, the TCM Vault Collection DVD of the, the shorter version, which was the best we had uh, up until this point, I mean, the, the quality jump is massive and it, it looks quite staggering throughout. So it, it's an absolutely incredible presentation. And it makes a particular visual effect stand out more because there's a, it's a particular stylistic touch that Browning employs in the quiet moments between uh, Nanon and Malabar, the sort of 
uh, would-be lovers coming closer to one another, uh, there's a certain style effect used where it's a sort of uh, cross-stitched or screen-type pattern that is sort of overlaid. I, I don't know. They may have actually just put it over the camera lens, which is something that was was done as an effect to varying degrees. It's, it's an old technique, for, but um, I, I'm not sure if that was done in camera or as, as an optical leader, but it's sort of overlaid over a, a few scenes between those two characters, I guess, to sort of signify this is a moment where they're uh, being more open and upfront with one another. But uh, in this new master, that really comes across much more than it did on the DVD version. So you'll notice that it's a particular stylistic choice that pops up three or four times in the film uh, just for those particular moments between those two characters. In terms of the audio, we have a brand new score by Philip Carley, which is presented in Lossless Stereo. It's a fantastic score. It beautifully fits the film. Um, I've seen the shorter versions of The Unknown, and the various scores were, were very good, but I think this new score really suits the film perfectly and is, is definitely the best score I've heard for it yet. And I, I think this will make a fantastic viewing option for those who have seen the film and uh, newcomers will really be blown away. So I think the score is really well done, nicely recorded. It's great. We have it in lossless stereo. And again, I think it's the, the best score for the unknown I've yet heard. Now, in terms of extras, that are specific to the unknown, there's really only one, which is a commentary track by David J. Skull. And since this is the longer, newly restored version of the film that reinstates footage, and Skull had previously recorded a commentary for that TCM Vault Collection DVD of the shorter version, I think think what this commentary track is is a modified or updated version of that previous commentary track um, I haven't listened to the older version in quite some time but because this is a newer restoration with additional footage uh, it is basically a, a modified version of his already uh, pr excellent previous commentary that he had recorded for the unknown and again listening to this now it's not only one of the great commentaries, as all of Skull's commentaries are, pretty much, if he recorded a commentary, it pretty much automatically went into the list of greatest commentaries of all time because of his incredible scholarship and insight into these films. But uh, it's also incredibly poignant hearing it now, being somebody who basically grew up with uh, seeing and hearing David J. Skull on physical media releases in terms of producing extras and then reading his books and, and scholarship and things. So uh, he's definitely been one of the, the, the names that I grew up with. So it was really poignant listening to his outstanding commentary for the unknown uh, now that he's unfortunately no longer with us. But it is... As with all of his other commentaries, one of the best commentaries ever recorded. It's a film school on a disc and is so jam-packed with information. It also makes up for the fact that this is really the only specific extra devoted to the unknown in the set. Um, there are you know, other extras that cover the unknown, but this is the one that is specific for the unknown. And it's one of David J. Skull's essential commentaries. And that other extra I was referring to that covers basically Todd Browning more in general and these three films along with uh, the rest of his overall catalog is entitled Sideshow Todd, an interview with Megan Abbott. It's done in the now traditional sort of criterion style where we have a critic uh, basically being interviewed in a particular room with or, or with theater style seating or something and a sort of generic background that's out of focus which is then intercut with clips from the films and images of of uh, of the subject being talked about so this is a nice lengthy piece on these three films with a more general overview and a general overview of Todd Browning's career. It's, it's nicely done. It's also nice that it's, it's lengthy and the, it's also a nice uh, compliment to the other extras and supplements in this release. But again, it's, it's more of an overall piece that is basically sectioned into talking a bit about each of the three films and then about Todd Browning more in general. My only issue with this is 
something that I, I run into with a lot of this type of extra that Criterion does. And this again goes back to their disk encoding practices. Because on, on this and a lot of the Criterion uh, critic interview pieces where they're just sitting in a room somewhere, particularly if you're watching this upscaled on a 4K television, it makes it more prevalent. But uh, the, the encoding of these extras is not the greatest. And so when the, the critic or person is talking, if you look around them or behind them, you'll notice that the out of focus background is filled with compression noise and sometimes has the the dreaded sort of uh, moving halo grain noise effect around the person. Um, obviously, it makes sense that extras are more compressed to save room for the features, but you don't have to encode them at this level of compression noise city behind a person because it does actually get distracting um, because once you notice it, you can't unnotice it and I don't really run into this on any other uh, label, whether it be studio or boutique label, on extras to a continual degree like I do on these Criterion pieces. That And it's always when it's the uh, sit down, just in basic interview with a critic where the background's out of focus, but there's like a wall of constantly shifting compression noise throughout, which again... It does get distracting, so when I notice it, I, I have to say something because I continually run into this, and it's, again, sort of symptomatic of uh, more modern Criterion Blu-rays not having the greatest encoding in the world. Um, you know, some degree of that is to be expected because, again, you do have to compress extras down to save more space for the feature, which makes sense, but you do still have to decently encode them enough to where it's not somebody talking but you keep getting distracted by the moving noise and compression artifacts that are everywhere behind them so uh, yeah it's just something that I, I keep seeing on uh, this particular type of extra on Criterion releases and so that brings us to the immortal 1932's Freaks which has a reputation all on its own and quickly gained that when the film was so reviled upon release that MGM didn't even want their name on it and famously sold off the film and also made sure it was hacked down to the roughly 62 minute version that we have which means that the film is unfortunately devoid of a lot of scenes we've never gotten to see uh, is filled with uh, fade outs and missing frames and yeah you can definitely feel the 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 editorial just chopping down wholesale throughout even if you don't know anything about the film's history uh, there's there's a reason why it doesn't feel as quite as complete as as you might think it would and why it's at a a quite brisk 62 minute runtime now the main reason of course why freaks has a particular reputation and why it was so reviled uh, in 1932 it was that MGM wanted a great horror film to sell to compete with the uh, successes other studios, primarily Universal, had had uh, throughout 1931. Uh, of course, Irving Thalberg asked for a horror film and instead got uh, Todd Browning him essentially giving him freaks. And famously, Thalberg, you know, said a, a, a variant of, well, I asked for something horrific and I certainly got it. And what this stems from really is the fact that the public at large was being confronted by uh, Todd Browning's usage of actual circus and carnival sideshow performers who worked in the sideshow circuit and basically had to make a living out of the various uh, deformities or uh, handicaps that they were either born with or happened to them. And uh, it was a particular part of show business that was not only longstanding, but something that Todd Browning actually grew up in because he had his entire circus background. And so really what his, his goal seems to have been is to try and give the general public a more 
textured and honest view of the circus life of the actual performers in uh, all the different aspects of what it takes to put on a circus. And it just so happens that they based the film off of the short story Spurs, which was brought to Browning by the actor Harry Earls, who had famously uh, been in Todd Browning's film The Unholy Three with Lon Chaney, uh, which was one of their greatest hits of the silent era. But outside of The Unholy Three, there weren't necessarily all that many roles for Harry Earls as an actor. So uh, that is why he really pursued this particular story and brought it to Todd Browning, who essentially uh, his vision seems to have been to try and use this as a a vehicle in terms of, of a plot line to then have his sort of circus life film. And it, it's it's not really a horror film. Labeling it a horror film is a misnomer. It really only has horror elements in the final moments of the film. And those are perfectly built up to. And it is a completely earned dramatic payoff for the fates that befall certain characters that the audience quickly loves to hate. Uh, but it is the, again, it's the usage of the and the casting of the actual performers themselves and essentially having the public look up close at these people but also not necessarily with the uh, the artifice of of having a narrative plot line and it being a movie and or being just as if they went to a carnival sideshow it's it's really a, a challenging film especially for that time period of essentially challenging an audience to look at these people as people and recognize that uh, they are not defined by uh, their their physical stature or their their handicaps so it's actually quite an emotional film and and touching in ways at least that's how i've always taken it and it is a film that's been endlessly debated there are some that feel it is insensitive or um is perhaps manipulative of of the various performers in terms of uh, trying to build a whole movie out of out of sort of showcasing them which I don't think is is what the film does and I don't think that's what Browning intended or did um, but again it's it's been a film of endless debate uh, ever since its its release and uh, again MGM essentially dumped it and and sold it off and so the film only existed in the book butchered state of the 62 minute runtime and sort of languished in obscurity until it was uh, rediscovered and exhibited at film festivals decades later and quickly became a cult film really because of the central browning theme once again of the outsider characters and that uh, browning was fascinated with having central characters be outsiders who were you know obviously considered misfits by society at large and never before or since was this more apparent than it is in freaks because everyone who works in the circus to a degree is removed from society at large it's it's a different lifestyle it's a different mentality it's it's a different world that's the that's the real part of freaks that makes it so striking is that Browning is able to convey this sense of the circus life as its own universe, and the audience is sort of a bystander looking in on all of this. Uh, it's also an, you know, an extremely pulpy plot in terms of the original uh, short story Spurs, the, 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 the actual plot setup of Harry Earls as Hans, who is uh, hopelessly in love with the beautiful trapeze artist Cleopatra of the circus, who is played by Olga Bakker. Lenova and how she enjoys toying with him until, of course, uh, the the little tidbit comes out that perhaps Hans has come into a great deal of money and then things change entirely. Uh, so it is uh, obviously in, in some ways, it, it, it's, it's not the most convoluted plot in the world, um, but it, it, it certainly is 
a means to gain the audience's sympathy for for these characters, particularly of of Hans being used and manipulated so uh, so plainly and so vividly that it, it does at points get extremely tough to watch because of the the levels of humiliation that this character is is forced to to endure. So uh, this is enhanced by the, the fact that we are given such a great degree of, of the circus lifestyle and that there's complete and total sympathy for the actual performers themselves. And so one could view it as sort of an extension of what they might actually be doing in the, in the actual carnival circuit itself, uh, just in their day-to-day -day activities. And also Browning and, 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 and company are, are playing around with, with some of this stuff in terms of trying to get some more, I, I guess you, you might say some more uh, bits of humor in there, uh, uh, some more slightly salacious elements to sort of play around with some of the scenarios of, of what you could do inside of a circus landscape with a, with an actual plot. Um, we do have really great uh, performances from our other cast members, uh, of course, the incomparable Wallace Ford, who is always a great asset to any film he's ever in. He's one of the great character actors, has a great performance as uh, Frozo the Clown. Or the fantastic Lila Hyams, who plays Venus, who's the love interest of Frozo. And uh, while she didn't have the uh, longest screen career, she's an absolute asset to any film she's ever in, for example. But it, it again, it is really the... The performers themselves who are the star of the show and what everybody remembers and i think easily why the film quickly became such a enormous cult film when it was essentially rediscovered in, in the 50s and 60s and that only grew over time but it is understandable that that some do not view the film in this way and do not see that uh, what Browning was was really going after was to try and create a film about acceptance really um, it, it's it is not a horror film it, it that is really not the the label that should be applied to it however if you do want to discuss those aspects freaks does build to one of the most unforgettable shock horror moments of any film of the 1930s let alone in all of cinema and that image is burned into people's brains even if they haven't seen the film it is it is that uh, essentially immortalized in in the annals of horror cinema and beyond and interestingly that moment is in, in a lot of ways directly tied to a particular moment with some similarities in Browning's previous film, West of Zanzibar, with Lon Chaney. So there's another linkage to one of his past collaborations with Chaney. This is also one of the, the Browning sound films that he's actually seemingly more engaged. It's always been said that Browning was never comfortable with sound films and he never reached the same heights that he did in the silent era. And I think there's some degree of truth to that, but also the catastrophic failure of Freaks in terms of box office returns is uh, well known as the factor that pretty much derailed uh, Browning's career and why he only made a few features after this and then basically retired and he was never able to really get over the, uh, the, the, the just terrible reputation the film had and its uh, lack of any major success and MGM essentially trying to get their name taken off of it. So it is unfortunate that this film did directly or indirectly cause the career slump and then eventual sort of cutoff of, of Browning's career. He basically was able to end his, his cinematic work with several rather interesting and I think underrated, essentially quasi-remakes of some of his past silent film hits. Of course, Mark of the Vampire was essentially a remake of The Lost London After Midnight, and The Devil Doll is a fascinating science fiction horror melodrama hybrid that takes quite a bit of Browning themes and parts of The Unholy Three and some other films and sort of mixes them together, um, which is why it's one of my favorite Browning films, because it's it's 
wonderfully uh, eclectic in, in that sort of way. But uh, a- after that and a few other projects, uh, that was pretty much it for Browning. And again, it was really mostly due to the, the, the failure of Freaks being just essentially hung around his neck. And again, that was sort of what, what he became most known for. So that is unfortunately true for uh, derailing the career of one of the great directors. But again, I think there's some truth to the to the notion that he was never as comfortable directing sound films as he was in the silent era. And of course, the production code getting strictly enforced in 1934 was not a good thing for Todd Browning because pretty much every film he made, including Freaks, uh, especially uh, before 1934, would come under the furor of the code like crazy. Even Dracula, of course, famously had many cuts made to it for the 1938-1939 reissue, which, of course, the film was then stuck that way for decades until the uh, the attempts to restore those, those trimmed materials in the late 1980s. Uh, but uh, Freaks is a particular film that is undeniably unique there's there's not another film quite like it and i i think it's extraordinarily uh, poignant and for me it's always been very obvious that it's a film about acceptance and uh with with a great sense of understanding for for the for the actual people themselves not the uh, not the just the circus life and and the sideshow circuit and the, the the whole experience of living in the circus, but also for the the the, the people who make that a reality, the people who put on the shows every day, and the actual sideshow performers themselves actually looking at them as human beings. Uh, so it is remarkably ahead of its time in that sense, and I think it was audiences being forced to confront. Uh, these these aspects that were not really things that people thought about and being directly confronted by uh, people with with disabilities with real you know actual close-ups in a Hollywood studio film in 1932 was obviously too much for most audiences to take or handle and so there was this sort of knee-jerk reaction against the film and it, it, again, MGM was probably the last studio you would associate with wanting to produce a film of this nature due to just uh, their overall output being uh, about more stars than there are in the heavens. So it's it's one of the, just about one of the last films you would think that would have been produced and actually released by MGM. But I, I, again, it's it's a film that is unbelievably striking, but it's also harmed by the fact that it was brutally chopped down to just over an hour. It's 62 minutes long, and there are multiple pieces of the film that have just never been reinstated. And unfortunately, there is, I I think, especially if you have more of a knowledge of, of editing and pacing, and that's something that you pick up on, there is an inherent sort of choppiness. There's a lot of fades in the film. There's there's a lot of uh, missing frames here and there, some of which were thankfully able to be restored for this new master. So it's also been a victim of of how it was handled and how it was essentially sort of cast off as as unwanted so the film itself is an outsider in that way it's it's almost the because of that it's almost the ultimate browning film is a film that ultimately nobody wanted in 1932 and all we have is a heavily truncated and altered version of that film that still has a great emotional core to it and a a great degree of poignancy. So we get what Browning was after. We get the idea of it. We still have pretty much the general plot, but it does feel a bit abbreviated. And that even goes into how the ending is handled. MGM did put a sort of tag ending on uh, what we had and even re-edited and reshot some materials for the ending to soften it a little bit. So the absolute shock horror moment doesn't quite hit as hard as it would have. And this has thankfully gone in into in the extras uh, describing how the original ending actually was and that it went on longer and it was differently structured. But that's also why the the very tag ending is of noticeably lesser degraded quality because that was essentially stuck on as a sort of last 
last ditch. Well, we have to have something here so the audiences aren't completely beside themselves. And it, it doesn't quite work. It, that, and that's why, because it was essentially sort of tacked on there. So it, it's a great shame we've never been able to actually see Freaks in its entirety as it was originally produced and made. Uh, it's probably never going to happen, but at least with the great scholarship and supplements that are out there and here on this disc release, uh, we're able to further understand uh, what uh, Browning and company were, were going for, how the film was originally intended to play out in its entirety, and it does give us a greater appreciation for uh, the achievement they made in the version that we have. But you can never get away from the fact that the film was literally hacked down to 62 minutes, and there are moments where you can definitely tell that somebody else came in here and has removed something or restructured something. Uh, again, particularly the the opening and closing bookends because it's it's quite obvious that <laughs> other people after the fact came in and just took the scissors to freaks and we're lucky we have the film in as good of a condition and state that we have it but it always has to be understood that we only have a surviving version of the film it's not the original length of course but it's also like what we've seen in the unknown and how the unknown was for a great number of decades it was incomplete and while it's mainly uh, small pieces and bridging and transitional material that was restored to the unknown. The same can be said of Freaks, and hopefully someday uh, a similar restoration of, of discovered footage could be possible for Freaks to even enhance its reputation further. But as it stands, this is still one of the immortal cult films, one of the immortal films, period, that uh, will, will never uh, disappear from uh, popular consciousness. And it's, it's a film that uh, once actually seen, I, I think it's, it's rather obvious that it was intended to not only give a sort of view behind the curtain of circus life and have at least some degree of the, the trappings of a horror film to satisfy the wishes of Thalberg and MGM and the thirst of the uh, public at the box office for the newly sort of named horror genre in the midst of the golden age of, of the form but that this is really a film that is trying to actually achieve some greater understanding of the human condition in areas wh which were rarely, if ever, even covered or addressed. So I do think it is ahead of its time in a number of areas. It is not a perfect film, but it's also hard to judge it because we're only stuck with a particular release version that's cut down to just barely over an hour. So it's without question that it's not exactly fair to judge Freaks in the version that we have it because it's not as it was fully originally intended and even has an additional uh, tweaked and tag ending put on the actual uh, tweaked ending that uh, we have in some version. But in in spite of all of that, it still remains one of the immortal films, and it's fantastic we now finally have a newer Preservation Master, a modern scan, and something to upgrade over the old Warner DVD. So of course, we accept it, we accept it, gobble gobble. I couldn't resist at least once. Now to talk about the picture quality, this is again a brand new scan and a new restoration master for Freaks, which means you're having to deal with the compromised surviving elements of the cut down 62 minute release version. It is credited that uh, Criterion for this release did a 5K scan of different elements, primarily a nitrate dupe negative and a 35 millimeter safety print. So this is mixing and matching two different sources and seemingly is the best that survives because the original negative is long gone and all we have is the release version of the film so nothing is known to exist for any of the original elements now in terms of of this master it is of course a gigantic upgrade over the old warner dvd which dates back to 2004 so to say it's an upgrade in visual quality over the old dvd is understating it enormously this is a gigantic upgrade overall in visual quality Every element has improved from 
the level of detail uh, from what they could get out of these particular sources. The grayscale in particular is significantly improved, which is usually the biggest improvement you have on black and white films, regardless of what the uh, source or condition is. When you do a new modern scan, it's almost always going to be the grayscale uh, that's that's going to imp uh, benefit the most because older scans tended to downplay the grayscale and make it almost more subdued instead of being a, a really much more nuanced uh, range of grays and uh, elements between the black and white. It's, it's honestly the hardest part of doing uh, black and white titles in terms of scans and mastering and then presenting on disc releases is you have to make sure you get the grayscale right. And on older masters and standard definition, uh, that usually didn't come through all that much. It was very rare that you had a black and white film, especially one like Freaks, which is coming from limited elements and a cut down version at that. And the quality does vary from scene to scene. So it, it's, it's a harder film to transfer and master because you've got a, a sort of myriad patchwork of elements and it had a very troubled release history and of course I'm sure preservation history as well so it's not going to be as consistent as it should be because of that so in this presentation it looks absolutely fantastic when compared to the DVD but you do need to expect there is some inherent wear still there simply due to how the film has been handled and its overall release history over the years so there are a, a, a there is a little bit of damage here and there it's usually very minor I did spot one or two hairs here and there but overall everything is is contained as much as possible unfortunately because the film was edited in the way that it was there are a number of fades that do feel abrupt and of course there's a number of missing frames even though they are very small they are there and they were worse off on the DVD so it seems like some of those frames have been recovered so because it seemed like it it played better and, and was more complete and had less of the little tiny jumps so you can definitely tell there has been new work done here but unfortunately due to just how this film was handled it, it it's unfortunately kind of stuck in this form and this is pretty much the best you can do so uh, it is to be commended that the restoration efforts were done as as best as humanly possible in terms of the visual restoration I think aside from the the signs of how the film was edited and the handful of missing frames and one or two moments that that look a bit softer uh, you've obviously got the tag ending that was imposed upon the film that has always been notably degraded in its quality and it's even more so here in terms of how much that comes across because we're seeing it in much higher resolution now so the very end of the film is of noticeably low quality but that's just inherent to how that ending was shot and just basically stuck on the end of the film as far as anybody knows it's always looked that bad it's just now magnified further uh, the only other thing I really noticed is there's there are one or two very slight lines poking in here and there they're, they're very minor but again it seems to be intrinsic to the sources that have been used for this but honestly uh, I, I do have one issue with the visual presentation and Unfortunately, I, I thought we were going to make it through this set without a major encoding issue, but uh, it rears its ugly head towards the very end of the film. Uh, the entire transfer looks fantastic, except for one shot at the very climax of the uh, iconic moment when uh, Cleopatra is running away through the the forest and the storm at night as uh, everyone is chasing after her right as we go to the fade out to the actual ending in terms of the version that we have with the iconic shock moment um Unfortunately, on that last shot of uh, Cleopatra standing at the tree in the storm and she turns to scream and we get that fade out. Unfortunately, we have a really bad example of the uh, what I always term the sort of frozen grain or noise effect that does pop up when uh, film transfers on disc or just masters in general aren't 
consistently mastered well, or uh, I'm not exactly sure what causes this phenomenon all the time, because sometimes it's, it's a case like this where it's just one shot or a particular scene where it exhibits this. But it is this one particular shot, and it's even more apparent when you upscale this to 4K if you're watching it on, say, an OLED or a 4K LED. But it's unfortunately the really bad uh, type of the frozen grain effect because normally where you'll see sort of stagnant grain around something that's moving particularly a, a person's head in close-ups which is usually where you see it a lot of times well here of course it's a close-up but it's the really bad variety where pretty much the entire frame looks frozen and as her head is moving it's it's the the really bad variant that I sort of term it looks like somebody or something is moving through a jello mold because it seems to want the, the actual grain and noise and structure of the image seems to want to move with the person's head um it's it's the type that is exhibited in the terrible paramount 4k master of the godfather for example um it's just in this one shot but unfortunately i can only chalk that up to disk encoding because the rest of the transfer is perfectly fine and spotless and does not exhibit this at all so unfortunately that did mar the, the presentation for me. It's only one shot. I know that sounds minor, but it's quite notable and it's in a really climactic moment, even though it's very brief because it's in a fade. I, I, I It was very visible and noticeable when the screen suddenly goes really smeary for, for a shot. Again, I'm not exactly sure why this occurs, but I do see it from time to time on certain discs. Usually it's very minor, but it's it's been a long while since I've seen a Blu-ray or a UHD with this problem that has the, the really bad uh, effect of pretty much the whole screen looking smeary. And again, it's it's like somebody's trying to move. It's like the image is trying to move through jello. Um, that's the best way I can describe it. It's it's very bizarre, and trying to capture it in, in terms of uh, screen captures or making a little clip is very difficult because it's only really visible when you're actually watching the disc in motion, especially on a larger display, and even more so when you're watching it on a 4K display when this disc is upscaled, because otherwise it looks fantastic. But that was really notable, so that that is the one factor that does... Uh, bring down the overall visual quality for me because it's a climactic moment of at the very end of the film and you make it almost all the way through the film without any encoding issues and the other two features don't have any and then you get to one of the climactic shots of the film and the whole screen goes smeary for a few seconds and it's like this is not good guys so this is unfortunately a phenomena that I run into occasionally, but this is one of the most notable ones I've, I've seen in a while because it was a, a really bad example for a short shot, admittedly, but a very climactic shot. In terms of the audio, we have the original mono mix in lossless PCM. It's a single channel rendering, so if, if you're like me and you have bigger tower speakers, you will have to uh, engage dual channel mono mode on your receiver or just uh, the or a true stereo mode or whatever your option is to have uh, your better main speakers playing back the mono track in dual mono. This was a new audio transfer as well. Of course, they still were working with limited elements just like the picture and it does seem to be based on the same materials the dvd was working from uh, thankfully this does sound better than the dvd because it is a new transfer um, unfortunately i don't have the laser disc to compare with it's one of the lds i've, I've just not gotten to pick up yet so i, I need to uh, pick up a copy of that to compare that digital audio track to this one frequently for uh, titles that are held by warner that were originally under mgm uh, it, it can be a case where the laser disc is the most most untouched version of the audio if they're using the same source, which most are. Usually the DVDs would add a lot of EQ and noise reduction. Then there are also cases where the new mastering on the Blu-ray or UHD is far superior because they had a better source or uh, the track was just rendered better and sounds less muffled. Unfortunately, I do think this is uh, about the same as the DVD audio, but actually I think the DVD audio might be a little bit less manipulated in terms of noise reduction, EQ, and such. So um, I would like to get a copy of the Laserdisc release that MGM UA did, which has a digital audio track. It's just an LD I haven't picked up yet. So unfortunately, I don't have that to compare with, but I did compare with the DVD audio, and 
Actually, I do think the DVD audio is actually a little bit better, but uh, unfortunately, this this is not an uncommon thing, and that's why I, I do as many comparisons as I can uh, in terms of audio with past releases. So um, as soon as I can find a good copy of the Laserdisc, I'll compare the audio of the LD with the DVD and Blu-ray as well. The audio does sound good. I think there are there's, of course, some inherent defects. There is a little bit of harshness at times, which you... Are, are pretty much going to expect in any film of this era that's also you know technically still an early enough talkie but also uh, has had a variety of element issues and preservation issues over the years so they're obviously not working from the best source to begin with so that limited quality factor is always going to play into things there is a good amount of background hiss that is relatively light so it sounds nothing out of the ordinary and thankfully there hasn't been an overly excessive amount of hiss removal because we still have some there. Now to move on to the supplemental features for Freaks. Uh, most of the supplements are actually taken from the Warner Brothers DVD, the ones that were produced by David J. Skull, who appears in them and narrates them, and are, of course, standard definition upscaled on this release. They're upscaled quite well, so they do look quite good. So uh, thankfully, it's not the sort of uh, lackluster porting that, that some studios and labels do in terms of when they port uh, DVD era standard definition legacy extras. So the that's why pretty much the majority of the extras are in standard definition because they're stemming from the excellent DVD. It's also really difficult, if not impossible, to improve upon these older extras because they were so well done that uh, that that DVD was one of the best that Warner Brothers ever did during the heyday of DVD and of course, that's really due to the, the, the extras being produced by David J. Skull and another uh, tribute to his incredible career as a film historian and also producer of supplemental features. So the bulk of the material is in the main documentary made for the DVD entitled Freaks the Sideshow Cinema. It's an hour and five minutes long where they go through the entire production history of the film, its development, the, uh, the cast and crew, particularly with a great deal of biographical graphical information and background of the entire cast, particularly focusing on all of the performers themselves and giving you essentially a miniature biography of each of the characters we see in the film, in addition to their history uh, in terms of their career, both in and out of the circus and the various acts that they would do. It's also a sort of crash course in the history and development of the sideshow attractions and the sideshow circuit inside of the circus world itself. So you get that really great sense of actual history being contained in addition to learning more about the production of the film. It is incredibly well done. Again, it's over an hour long and is basically your major one stop for a crash course in both circus and performing history and the history and lives of the performers we see in the film, but also Freaks itself and Todd Browning and uh, what happened to Todd Browning's career after Freaks. We also get a specific section on the alternate endings, which was basically a supplement to the documentary where David Skull talks about uh, the attempts to tweak and change the ending and also describing more of what the original ending was like before these changes and additional footage were uh, made and added. Added. Also, this rather amusingly underlines the encoding issue I was talking about with the main feature because we have that same shot of Cleopatra, which has the terrible frozen grain effect in the feature transfer. But here on this extra, which is uh, basically an upscaled uh, standard def file already reduced in quality from the original DVD. Um, you know, it, it, it should look crummy. It shouldn't look as good as the feature, obviously, and the new Preservation Master. But you know what it doesn't have? It doesn't have that frozen grain problem when that shot comes up. So uh, that that is a good comparison. If, if you're curious, if you happen to notice that in the feature transfer, if you switch over to the little featurette on the alternate endings, when that shot comes up and they're using it for Mourner's DVD Master on this old standard of file, uh, it does not have that phenomena. So 
that kind of underlines uh, the, the, the fact that, unfortunately, that flaw is there in the encoding and handling of that particular shot on the feature transfer. We also have the inclusion of the alternate prologue that originally opened the film on the 1947 reissue version. This is a, a very short piece. It's also standard def and is upscaled and was also on the DVD as well. Also, one note I wanted to make, when you select any of the uh, documentary materials that were on the DVD, DVD, there's a disclaimer that pops up saying that they might contain some terminology that is considered uh, offensive or outdated. I, 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 I guess it's because some of the terms are, are, are no longer considered the ones of choice, I'm thinking, because it, it took me a minute to figure out what that disclaimer was actually in reference to. It's obvious that uh, no offense was intended, but uh, that it, it took me a minute to figure out why there was a disclaimer there, but I think it's in reference to one particular term, which is not the the the, the term that uh, people would choose to use today. But that's why that is that is on there for uh, it, it's sort of put on all of the Warner DVD extras when you select them. We of course also have Skull's commentary track from the DVD release, which is of course, outstanding and one of the best commentaries ever recorded. It is a must-listen, and hearing it again on this release was fantastic, but also, as with all of the supplements uh, where, where you're seeing him again or hearing his voice again, it's just really incredibly poignant now uh, that he's no longer with us to... Uh, hear his incredible uh, commentary work once more, but thankfully that has been uh, ported here, so it is preserved alongside the other DVD extras. And then for even more of that poignancy factor, we have uh, Skull's audio reading of the original short story Spurs itself, which is fascinating because it has basically the, the same sort of core idea in some of the setting, but uh, gets even more detailed and goes to some even darker territories for characters uh, who don't have that same fate in the film. And it's it's quite lengthy, so it's it's Skull reading the story beautifully, and it's it's you know about about 48, 49 minutes of of him reading the story. So it takes an amount of time, but it's very much worthwhile because I had not gotten to actually ever read the story before, and Skull had an incredible speaking voice that was very attention grabbing to begin with. So he he perfectly reads the story, but again. The, the poignancy factor is very much there because you, you, you're continually reminded, uh, especially if you're like me and, and you followed his work and scholarship for uh, you know, most of your adult cinematic life, at least. Uh, so it's, it just was another of these extras and supplements that makes this release overall have such a, a poignant air to it because it's such a tribute to uh, Skull's incredible uh, career as a film scholar and historian. We have a new extra entitled One of Us Portraits from Freaks, which runs about 11 minutes, and this is actually some really fantastic photography of all of the different performers from the film uh, from various stages of their life and career set to some really nice appropriate music cues. It's, it's basically a really nice nice uh, featurette that just gives you a greater idea of of who they were as people and uh, giving you a bit more tangible in terms of visuals a, a bit more uh, tangible feeling of of what their lives must have been like and again outside of just freaks there are some images and stills from the production but it, it was a really nice touch to have basically each performer get a section devoted to them and some images that that Criterion was able to put together and the musical selections again were, were, were very well done so it's it's one of the the better sort of photo montage galleries I've seen in a very long time and then rounding off the extras is an episode of the ticklish business podcast where they of course talk about mostly classic Hollywood films but uh, they basically have a roundtable discussion about freaks and in particular uh, the the main focus of this podcast episode was about uh, representation in terms of disability. So it's, of course, uh, a perfect uh, longer form discussion about that particular topic and how it relates to the film. But I, I, I must say, it's always kind of weird when, when I see podcast episodes included in disc supplements for a podcast. This was apparently recorded in 2019, uh, and you can view it uh, freely on their, their various platforms for that podcast. But it, it's always kind of weird when I, I see a podcast episode that from 
say pa years past included in supplemental features because it, it's it, I, I'm not exactly sure how to take it because it, it's a great um, supplement, uh, but it's also not something that was newly produced for this release or for a past release. So it's it, it, it's kind of odd. In some ways, it kind of feels like like cheating in a sense. <laughs> if that's a thing in terms of physical media releases, I'm, I'm not exactly sure, but um, it, it just it it it's it's kind of one of those inclusions where it's like, well, I'm I'm glad they they felt the need and did include something else, and it's a good discussion piece. So don't don't get me wrong there, but you could very easily just go and follow the podcast yourself uh, and and listen to that episode um, for free. So it's. I mean, it's 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 nice to see um, things like podcasts getting greater recognition, uh, especially nicely done episodes like this one. But again, it just always kind of throws me a little bit. The the few times I've seen this happen, where a, a label includes a podcast from years past as as part of the supplements, it's just it it, it feels a little odd. Essentially, is is what I'm trying to say. Um, so. I'm glad Criterion did include something else that is technically newer and didn't just entirely rely on the 2004 DVD extras that David Skull produced and the the one uh, photo montage that they did. But again, it, it just feels kind of weird because it's a podcast episode from 2019 and you could, again, follow that podcast and listen to that episode for free if you wanted to on their platform. So... You know, I mean, it's it's great for them to to get on a Criterion release, which is super cool. Of course, I I myself and most everybody who makes anything in in regards to classic films and or 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 podcast or videos would be ecstatic if if something of ours could could get on an official media release. But um, it's still it feels kind of just a little bit weird. I know it's getting a bit more commonplace to see uh, various podcast episodes or, or different things like that included on physical media releases from labels, but it's still, I, I'm not very used to it, I guess is probably the, the best way to put it, but it's still a great listen, don't get me wrong, and, I, and I, I'm glad we do have a, a newer extra on here. Uh, so again, it didn't just rely on the one photo montage and otherwise just the DVD extras, but again, it, it is, just it feels a little bit weird to just suddenly switch over to a podcast episode that Criterion uh, just added to the supplements. Now to move on to the packaging and design, we have one of Criterion's deluxe slipbox releases with a lovely aesthetic, obviously trying to look like a carnival poster or a circus ad to try and draw people in. The title, of course, is Todd Browning's Sideshow Shockers, and thankfully we do have representation for all three films on the cover with all the titles because I think most uh, artwork designs would be very tempted to focus primarily on Freaks, that being the most famous film and the one people are mostly going to be buying this set for but I, I'm very appreciative that we got representation and images of all three films with the titles on here and we of course have nicely invented taglines as well so again going for the sort of old circus poster that's a little bit worn a little bit distressed a nice uses of color and the black background does give it that sort of uh, older aesthetic that does really make it feel like it is from the past. So I do think the overall design and aesthetic is really well done. And I even like that the Criterion logo itself is in here and looks a bit distressed. So it's made to match. This, of course, carries over onto the spine, which is yellow on one side and then blue on the other. The rear carries over this design and the otherwise traditional Criterion layout. And then this is a slip box affair with a digipack inside. And the digipack sort of carries over the same aesthetic. It's a little simple, but this I think is made to look like a sign because when you open it, you've got the arrow pointing towards the actual opening with all of the titles. So again, I think this is supposed to look like an entry sign as you're going into the sideshow tent. And then of course we open it to find more of the sort of circus motif and then the discs inside on a double stacked tray. 
And then the disc labels also have a sort of circus motif with the sort of distressed star. The booklet is just sort of tucked in here as most Criterium releases do these days. So it's just kind of loose, but when you actually have the booklet in here, it makes the overall digipack thicker so it, it fits in the slip box and so it's not sliding around. But when you take the booklet out, that's why this then feels a little bit flimsier because it it's not bolstered by the booklet sitting inside. The booklet is given a sort of notebook design in terms of the aesthetic, so it's supposed to look like, I think, a, a, little, um, a, a little notebook that's hardbound. The design aesthetics carry on into the booklet itself, which has some nice imagery, and then the basic information and description of each of the films with a sort of unique cover artwork design in terms of the actual what's on the pages for each of the films because they're not given their own particular covers. So the aesthetic carries over into the imagery very well and they, they really nicely match the two. So we get a little bit on each. And then the main essay is by Ferenc Smith Neme talking about Todd Browning's career and his overall trajectory and his core themes, which appear vividly in all three of these films, which is why they're so unified. So this is another of her really well done essays. Packed with a lot of great imagery as well. It's also really nice to have this in a stapled booklet and not be trying to read this in one of Criterion's big fold-out uh, clumsy to, <laughs> to handle booklets. So I'm always happy whenever we can get an actual stapled booklet from Criterion. And then, of course, the last page is the credits and the uh, technical information about the restorations performed and the new scores. So those are my thoughts on the Criterion Blu-ray release of Todd Browning's Sideshow Shockers, the set that contains the beautiful new restoration of The Mystic, the beautiful restoration that uh, reinstates missing footage into the masterpiece The Unknown, and the new restoration of Freaks, which is by far and away better than the old DVD presentation in its visuals. I think the new supplements are, are very well done, and I think all of the vintage legacy extras and all of the contributions of David J. Skull alone are worth the entire purchase price of this set. And also, it's a beautiful set uh, in, in tribute to the works of Todd Browning, who is still extraordinarily underrated in terms of American cinema in general. Uh, but also, it is one of the more impressive Criterion releases in a while overall in terms of the overall package design, the strength of the artwork, the strength of the essay, the strength of the new restoration, and the supplements packages overall. Uh, my only major qualm, of course, is with the disc encoding in a few select areas, and most of all, just for it, it rearing its ugly head in one shot of the climax of Freaks, which was, again, very unfortunate and, and sad to see. But otherwise, uh, the, the encoding and presentations of the films are excellent, and the two silent films fare beautifully. In fact, I did give this release an award in my Disc Awards for 2023 as being, along with Kino's release of The Trap from the Universal Restoration, as uh, as the tie winner for Best Silent Release of 2023, uh, because the, the silent films here are beautifully presented. And really, the entire set is worth it alone for the reconstruction and restoration of The Unknown, which is a silent masterpiece and arguably the, Todd Browning's greatest directorial achievement, featuring one of Lon Chaney Sr.'s greatest performances and to have any footage restored to that film to make it even uh, an even greater experience is staggering. So uh, Freaks is the big draw for most people. It is the film a lot of people had uh, hoped would come to Blu-ray for a great number of years, and it is a fantastic uh, upgrade over that old DVD and does retain all its legacy extras, but as uh, fantastic an improvement uh, as the Freaks transfer and restoration is. The, the real draw overall for, for cinephiles is having more footage reinstated into the unknown and having this George Eastman House restoration finally available on disc in a wide release. So that's that's at least my taking from, from this set. It's a fantastic set also for including the restoration of the mystic, which is a very rarely discussed and little seen uh, Todd Browning film that fits 
perfectly into his ovure. So this is very much a, a, a selection of three films that are all working on similar themes. They go together perfectly. So you can actually program and watch all of these together and they actually flow into one another. So that's another reason why I think it's great to watch them in chronological release order because the mystic flows into the unknown and the unknown actually flows into Freak. So they, they all have a synergy in that way because Todd Browning did have core themes that he did obsess over and appeared time and time and time again in his films. And you can watch Todd Browning films in succession and and recognize this stuff because they're right there. Um, so I, I think this set is a great testament to his body of work, to these films and having them properly recognized in uh, technically better versions than what's existed before. But the real standout is having the new restoration of the unknown with reinstated footage previously thought lost for decades. So as always, I hope my babblings about classic films, the world of Todd Browning, and of course physical media releases have been at least somewhat fun and informative. I do really think this Criterion release is very impressive, and especially when it's on sale in one of the frequent Criterion sales, is, is really a no-brainer because you're getting three fantastic films, one of which in Freaks is... Is, is not only a, a cult film favorite, but a classic in its own right, but the unknown now being more complete and fully restored and uh, being an even greater experience than how we knew it before and being given this wide release on a new Blu-ray and uh, alongside Freaks and The Mystic is really phenomenal. So I do think this is one of the must-own Criterion titles. I think the supplemental features package is really is something to marvel over, particularly because it's mostly utilizing uh, materials from the incredible David J. Skull, uh, whose presence is felt throughout the supplements. And again, it's it's a great testament to his entire um, legacy as a one of the great film historians. So as always, please do keep supporting both studio and boutique labels by buying films on disc in order to help keep both physical media and film culture alive and as always thank you ever so much for watching now i just have to not try to sink into a depressive funk and think about revenge and mutilation and all of my repressed emotions and things because i've been watching too many todd browning films and and i'm i'm a bit of a loner and an outcast and i'm an outsider uh this is the problem when you're a lonely cinephile and you watch too many todd browning films all at once